Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and today I'm going to have a conversation with an old friend, David Last, who's a professor at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario, and nowadays lately at the uh, Canadian Forces College here in, in Toronto. He's a political scientist. He retired from the Canadian military a number of years ago as a colonel, and uh, I knew him even before he was a colonel. Uh, when he was very much involved with peacekeeping in Croatia and in uh, Cyprus and a number of other places. So, hello, David. Hello, Mata. Do you remember how we got acquainted? Because I remember it very well. Uh, you wrote me a note when I was pres I was uh, editor of Peace Magazine, as I still am, and you asked me what I knew about peace gardens. It was, it was such an interesting question. I, I didn't do a good job of answering you because I didn't know anything about these gardens. But you had a very important project that you wanted to try. I was the battery commander of uh, headquarters and services battery and camp commandant for Blueberry Camp in Cyprus. We had become aware of um, uh, the importance of superordinate goals and other ways of attempting to bridge differences. And uh, after we arrived in, um, in Cyprus and we started looking into um, the, uh, the geography of the Green Line, uh, one of the areas where there had been repeated incidents was the Rocus Bastion in Nicosia. The idea was um, mooted that perhaps it could be a peace garden that was equally supported by the Greek Cypriot and Turk Cypriot uh, sides and would therefore reduce the, the tension of the area. In private, you would tell me things that were much more vivid <laughs> about how really the problem was there's this no man's zone around the green line, right? Sure. And the guys, the kids or the boys from each side would taunt each other, shout at each other. And as I recall, I have an even scatological story that you said that they were um, th that a hazing ritual involved uh, requiring the re young recruit to go out and leave a turd in the no man's zone where he was not supposed to go. <laughs> and this was a kind of inflammatory uh, escalation of tensions between the Turks and the Cypriot Greeks, right? <laughs> you were trying to figure out a way that you could have them get together and plant vegetables or flowers or something out in this uh, no man's zone or the, the place where they weren't normally supposed to go. I don't think you, you succeeded, as I recall. That's correct. So um, this is actually a good jumping off point for the larger problem of how peacekeeping has changed. Um, Canadian soldiers spent more than 30 years in Cyprus. Over the course of that time, um, the nature of the conflict changed. When we first arrived in Cyprus, uh, it was the first phase of UNFASIP, the UN uh, force in Cyprus. Um, the Greek Cypriot and Turk Cypriot populations were intermingled. They lived uh, together. They lived together. And then they separated. The Turks um, occupy, uh, the Turks launched a peace operation or what the Greeks called an invasion um, in uh, 1974, and I, I haven't I haven't checked my dates on this. I believe it was 1974. Um, there was a uh, um, a forced separation and a relocation of populations. The Green Line was drawn as part of a division, um, and Greek and Cip Greek and Turk Cypriot populations were moved back and forth north and south to separate the populations. You know, I, did, I don't think I ever knew that history. I, I think when I met you, it had already happened, and I it didn't realize that it had long before. But okay. the, the point here is that from, from that point on, the conflict in Cyprus was frozen, and the mandate for the peacekeeping mission was simply to preserve the status quo. And preserving the status quo meant that the conflict didn't get resolved at all. And the the failed venture of the Peace Garden was actually indicative of this inability to move forward um, to improve uh, the connections between the two communities. 
So there was a long-standing um, intercommunal conflict resolution steering committee. Um, Canadian Roger, uh, sorry, Ron Fisher um, was uh, was involved in that from the from the beginning, and uh, Ron Fisher and Bet Featherstone uh, did some some useful work. The Pearson Peacekeeping Center in the 90s was involved in uh, trying to bring Greek and uh, Turkish Cypriot communities together uh, to talk about um, reconciliation and rebuilding intercommunal relations. Um, but the conflict really remained frozen and efforts like the, the peace building garden and uh, the intercom intercommunal conflict resolution steering committee um, really had no traction. And the military was unable to, um, uh, to assist with that because it was really outside the military uh, mandate. The military mandate was simply to preserve um, the physical separation and the, um, what Galtung would call the negative piece, to preserve the absence of physical violence. And if there is no connection between um, that preservation of the absence of violence and progress on uh, reconciliation and communal reintegration, um, then you have a frozen conflict. Well, did um, you take a message in, from that, that, that the whole approach, this business of separating them, was a bad idea? Uh, is that your conclusion, or, you know, do you, <laughs> is it more ambiguous? I think you're right that it's much more ambiguous than that, because if you look at the conflicts around the world that are not frozen today, um, a frozen conflict is a pretty good deal if you happen to be <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, but it was frozen for so long. Cyprus, was, you were there 30 years or something, right? Well, I wasn't personally there. Yeah, but the, the peacekeepers uh, were. Yeah. Um, so there are, there are lots of legacy efforts to preserve uh, international, uh, to keep an international lid on, um, uh, peacekeep on, uh, on conflicts that could become um, a more serious problem, between, but the nature of conflict has changed uh, significantly since the end of the Cold War, and the kinds of peacekeeping tools that were um, uh, regular parts of the, uh, the international inventory of responses, um, they've evolved a great deal since I last put on a blue beret. And I haven't worn a, a blue beret since I was a major in, 19, in, in the former Yugoslavia in 1995. I want to hear some more stories from you about your own career and, and other things that you found yourself involved in. I know that you left uh, Cyprus and went, I don't know whether you went directly to Yugoslavia, but you certainly served in the former Yugoslavia in, I think, two different sites. Next time I was in the former Yugoslavia, was as a researcher in uh, uh, 1993. We had a funded project to do interviews with peacekeepers, uh, Canadian peacekeepers, in both uh, Croatia and Bosnia um, to explore what kinds of skills they needed for the new military missions they were involved in. I don't have a very good memory for dates. I don't know when, 90, what was going on in 94? So the Civil War really began in, uh, um, uh, you could say in 91. Um, by 92, um, the, uh, uh, the constituent republics had begun to break up. Um, there was a deployment, and uh, uh, I, I don't actually have a set of historical dates uh, in front of me here, so I'm going from memory uh, as well. But uh, by 92, we had sent, Canada had sent a battalion motoring south from uh, Lar down across the, uh, uh, the Sava River into, uh, into the, the former Yugoslavia. Um, by 93, uh, Mackenzie was in Sarajevo, and uh, people remember, uh, remember the siege of Sarajevo. Remember that better than anything else, I think. Yeah. Um, by '94, uh, we had a sort of a stable, uh, stable stalemate in which um, uh, the territory had been broken up. Um, Croatia was consolidating control under a Croat government based in Zagreb. Um, 
Uh, the rump Yugoslavia uh, was under Serb control out of Belgrade, and the um, uh, the Bosniak or um, Muslim Bosnian uh, government uh, was recognized in Sarajevo, but outside Sarajevo there were um, uh, hot confrontation lines around the ethnic um, entities of Republika Srpska uh, for the Serbs, um, a, uh, a Croat uh, territory supported out of Zagreb, um, and the uh, the Muslim entity uh, uh, governed from Sarajevo. Okay, when was Sarajevo? I mean, when was Srebrenica? Uh, Srebrenica um, was uh, July uh, 1995. Uh, um, so you're still there. You were near there. I was back in, uh, so in 1994, uh, 93 and 94, I was involved in a research project which had me traveling to parts of Yugoslavia to do interviews. Um, in May 95, uh, I was posted to uh, Zagreb as the military assistant to the Canadian deputy force commander. Uh, I remained there, so that was a, uh, that was in a blue beret um, I was the, uh, uh, the, the military assistant in the force commander's office of UNPF, uh, the United Nations Protection Force. And it was going through a, uh, a major metamorphosis at that time. Um, it, uh, uh, UNPROFOR is the, the acronym that people might remember associated mm -hmm. with Sarajevo, the UN Protection Force. Mm -hmm. Well, the UN Protection Force had become a little unwieldy by the summer of uh, 95. And uh, just as I arrived, it split into what were essentially um, three divisional commands, uh, which became separately mandated peacekeeping missions. Not to, not to be uh, difficult, but you guys weren't able to do any damn protecting at all, were you? I mean, these guys were fighting, and you couldn't stop them from fighting. You couldn't protect civilians who were caught in between. What in the hell were you doing there? I mean, uh, do, do you have any sense of achievement, whatever? Uh, I hate to be blunt, but, you know. No, it's a, it's a very good question, Meta, and you may remember that I've written chapters for you on this. Um, uh, yes, but they were all nicer than the questions I was about to ask. Well, let's uh, – so let's – let's dig into this uh, civilian protection business. Um, and uh, the short answer is um, uh, no, uh, the UN was not able to do the protection mission that it was assigned. Um, but there's a longer and more complicated uh, answer behind this um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of details that are worth exploring. Um, there are also uh, uh, aspects which uh, I think uh, 30, 40 years from now when all of the uh, documents are unclassified, um, there will be other uh, stories that can be told um, that will change the narrative a little bit. You, you, you recall uh, me um, sending out uh, a call for assistance about Srebrenica and the I UN. I do. <laughs> 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 It really was a, a very memorable experience. You sent me, you said, what do we do about this? Uh, you know, can you, can you contact anybody who knows what to do? And I spent the weekend sending faxes. Those were in the, the days when we used fax machines. And I had a stack of faxes this high of people from all over Europe, peace people, answering my query. And their answer was pretty similar to yours, was, well, I'm sorry, but it's kind of late, isn't it? And we don't have anything, that, any good ideas. So the reason that we were in that situation is that... That was about Srebrenica. It was, but uh, remember, Srebrenica was only one of three protected areas that were essentially Bosniak or Muslim enclaves uh, deep inside uh, Serb territory. Um, so Srebrenica, Zepa, and Gorazde uh, were the three UN protected areas. The largest of the, uh, and the, the most critical of the protected areas was Sarajevo. Um, and um, in my position as uh, military assistant to the deputy force commander, I attended the meetings um, that uh, General Janvier had 
with the uh, the leaders um, of the of the factions, military and civilian. Uh, my secondary function was uh, to assist in negotiating the terms of agreement, the memorandum of understanding uh, between the UN uh, and NATO uh, in the use of force. So I don't remember anything about that you know, memorandum. So we want to cover that the public briefly. Memorandum. That, was huh? a, that was an internal arrangement between NATO and the United Nations. So I wouldn't have heard about it anyway. No. Okay. But it is very, uh, it's a very good illustration of the way in which these missions can work. And I think um, uh, we've had much more of that kind of activity in order to make um, uh, interventions more effective when they involve NATO, the OSCE, the EU, the UN, and so on, um, the African Union. Um, there are no missions now that are not um, multi-dimensional, multi-agency, mm -hmm. uh, joint, international, public, private. Um, and it creates a very complex landscape, but it's not always a landscape which allows all of the parties to push in, the, in, in, in a constructive direction. Uh, okay, uh, that's very important, I think, because we want to come back to how, how peacekeeping has changed. Uh, and, and, and I don't think from, my vantage point, it always isn't, isn't always in a, a, a good direction, seems to me. Uh, there's more uh, what you would call robust action, uh, which I don't uh, always uh, favor. Anyway, uh, we're skipping around too much. Let's get back to Srebrenica. Srebrenica was um, unprotectable because it had been whittled down to a single Dutch company which over, a course, over the course of many months had, um, had a, um, it had very limited ammunition, it had no fuel, uh, its equipment was broken, its equipment could not be repaired or sustained or maintained because the Serbs would not allow um, resupply. The reason the Serbs would not allow resupply is that the um, Bosniak or Muslim uh, uh, troops were using Srebrenica as a safe area for um, refitting and rest uh, and mounting raids in the rear Serb area. So one of the principles of a protected area is that it's got to be uh, for civilian use only. Mm -hmm. uh, Srebrenica, Zepa, and Garajde, but particularly Srebrenica, um, were being used as part of the war effort in a partisan war against the Serbs in the rear area. Um, so the, uh, the Bosniaks were not innocent victims in this, um, nor were the 7,000 um, murdered um, men and boys um, all non-combatants. Many of them probably were, um, but uh, um, there were certainly combatants in the area. There's no doubt about that. Well, as uh, I recall, the Dutch have been criticized strongly for not having done something more vigorous to protect people. But it sounds as if they were, if what you seem to be saying, that they would not have been able to, um, really. They were undermanned, uh, under-equipped, um, in, a, uh, in an impossible position from the point of, of view of, uh, of, de of, of a defensible position. Uh, and they were not even entirely in the right. And that I think, I, I think that uh, the inability of the UN to ensure that um, protected areas were actively demilitarized is in fact part of the, part of the problem. I, I know that this is likely to be perceived as blaming the victim. Um, uh, and I don't want to uh, suggest that I am blaming the victim. I'm just saying that if you, uh, if you're going to declare a safe area, you have to be, you, the, the UN has to be in a position, um, to demilitarize and to ensure that it remains demilitarized. Mm -hmm. That was never the case with Srebrenica. Um, in terms but, of, but, but you're, you're implying that they just didn't try hard enough or at all. No, I don't think that's the case. 
Um, I think the effort was made, uh, but I think the parties to the conflict, both Serbs and Muslims, um, in the uh, um, in the um, in the area, uh, made it impossible for the UN to do its job. Um, okay. They were involved in what they perceived as a fight for survival, mm-hmm. and they were using every every vehicle uh, to achieve their strategic objectives, including the UN. The UN was an active um, an active part, and the NATO Air Force um, was perceived and called referred to by both sides as the Muslim Air Force um, because it uh, it would. Um, conduct airstrikes against the Serbs, but not against the Croats or the Bosniaks. Um, so um, Srebrenica was not in a position to be defended. Uh, when the attacks came, uh, we looked at airstrikes. We attempted airstrikes on a number of, uh, a number of occasions. Um, there were not uh, effective uh, targets for airstrikes. Um, uh, we... Uh, consulted with the Americans on um, bringing a marine expeditionary unit into the, uh, uh, to conduct either an extraction or a, um, uh, a support mission. Um, but uh, uh, suppression of air defense, of uh, uh, Serb air defense systems was an essential prerequisite. And the Serb air defense systems were integrated across the whole of the former Yugoslavia and based in Belgrade. So. Um, that was Looking, more- they're giving a, a clearly sad story, but we already knew it was a sad story. We all know the outcome of Srebrenica. We, we know that I, I think even to this day, Bosnia, at least parts that I'm familiar with, are you know, not havens of, of uh, peaceful bliss. Uh, I, I don't think... look a lot better than Afghanistan, and I think that's an important point. All right. But now, I mean, what is the message to be drawn from all this? Uh, you've been confirming what I think I started out by saying you did a poor job. The peacekeepers didn't do what they were there supposed to do. What could and should have been done instead? What went wrong? That What's the message and the lesson to be learned? So let me let me tell a story about um, uh, August, um, uh, and I think this was about August uh, 20th, uh, 1995. I'm still in a Blue Beret in Zagreb, and the UN Protection Force um, is now reorganized, and uh, credit for this goes um, to General Sir Rupert Smith. Um, a large part of the um, uh, a large part of the problem um, from ninety three through to ninety five was that any attempt by the UN to use coercive force was met by escalating force from the parties to the conflict. Um, well, any- but you're going to expect that to happen lots of times, right? I mean, you need to to be ready for that kind of thing. I presume. Yes, but let me explain this in words of one syllable, because unless you've been in a jeep with a pistol, you won't understand that the UN always has the option of self-defense. If I'm sitting in a jeep with a pistol and nothing else, and I'm confronted with a tank or machine guns, then it does not make sense for me to wave my pistol around. That's not going to defend me. So what self-defense means actually depends on the balance of forces. As long as the UN consisted of lightly armed battalions or what we sometimes referred to as self-support battalions, um, which were incapable of actually defending themselves against the local forces, then um, they could not defend themselves or execute their mission. Um, In uh, 1994, um, Canadian troops were in Sector West in Croatia, and um, Croatian troops uh, advanced down one of the main highways to clear Sector West of Serbs. Sorry. Canadians and uh, later Argentinian troops 
with armored vehicles and with effective weapons said, no, it's a protected area. You're not coming in. We're going to shoot you. And the Croats backed down because the forces were not in their favor. A year later, in May 1995, a different battalion was protecting that protected area. They were intimidated by the Croats. They were not effectively armed or trained or prepared to take defensive action. The Croats walked through the UN positions and cleared the area of Serbs. My first tour, a day after arriving in Zagreb of Sector West with the, the Canadian ambassador at the time, um, was a, um, a carnage-strewn field of uh, corpses and dead pigs and... Uh, it was um, uh, the aftermath of having cleared a protected area of Serbs. So if you're going to be in the protection business, you've got to have effective weapons and effective equipment and training. You also have to have the mandate, and a self-protection mandate is adequate. So I, I come back to August of 1995, um, and at this point, I'm still a staff officer in Zagreb. I'm writing the code cables back to UN New York. And around about every, every week, we report on the number of firing incidents. The typical number of firing incidents in Sarajevo in July of 1995 was about 2,000 a day, mostly heavy weapons, um, uh, frequently with civilian casualties. Um, and... Uh, by the 20th of August, um, the uh, typical number of uh, incidents were a half dozen a day, a dozen firing incidents a day, mostly celebratory fire and small arms. So what changed? The mandate didn't change. It was still a mandate for self-defense self and uh, a Chapter 7 mandate to enforce the protection of the protected area. So what changed between July and August in 1995? Well, the key change was this reorganization that I referred to by uh, uh, General um, Rupert Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, and his concept was three layers. Um, so the first layer was the UN forces, like the, uh, the Dutch force in Srebrenica or the, uh, uh, the Argentinian force in um, uh, Sector West. They're in white vehicles. They're in blue helmets. They can do presence patrolling but they're not really geared for war. As, but they uh, are lightly armed. They are armed and they have armored vehicles. But as Rupert Smith says, you don't go to war in white vehicles with blue helmets. Mm -hmm. So at the end of, towards the end of July 1995, NATO's Rapid Reaction Force deployed. The Rapid Reaction Force consisted of attack helicopters, self-propelled artillery, armored vehicles, and troops in camouflage. This is a force that was prepared to go to war. So now this um, is the second layer. This is the, the three layer. Layer. So your first layer is your white vehicles and blue helmets. When they get threatened, their method of self-defense is to go into, if you're shelling them, they go into bunkers. If you threaten them on the road, they turn back and they go back to base. But the second layer is the rapid reaction force and if you threaten them, they shoot back. When I'm there, I'm in a beret and a Jeep and I've got a nine millimeter pistol and that's it. So my self-defense is not going to be the same as if you threaten a main battle tank with artillery. Mm -hmm. The third layer was NATO's Air Force and the ability to strike anywhere in um, the area of operations. And so not only could you deal effectively with whoever was in front of you, but if they escalated, you could hit whoever was behind them. So let me tell you about a very specific incident that occurred, as I, as I remember it, on about the 4th of August, um, 1995. On the 4th of August, 1995, um, we get a call from um, Sarajevo Operations Center saying that um, they have uh, fired on a multiple rocket launcher. 
Who's? Um, a Serb, multiple rocket launcher, south of Sarajevo, elevated, traversed, and was about to fire rockets. It, the rockets were loaded. It elevated and traversed. And before it could fire those rockets, uh, pointing into Sarajevo, it was hit with 16 rounds of high explosive artillery and the rocket and the crew and the block around it were obliterated. This was from a plane? No, nope, this was from ground-based artillery. So an observer on the ground says, I see something about to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's loaded, it's raised, it's pointing at me. I don't have to wait for it to fire. Mm -hmm. I can kill it now. Immediately that that happened, there was a protest by the, uh, uh, the, the Russian delegate in the Security Council that the UN had exceeded its mandate. Mm -hmm. This happened within five minutes of the incident. <laughs> okay. Um, within about half an hour of that, we had a phone call in Zagreb from Shashi Tharoor, um, who was the um, uh, Undersecretary for uh, Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping. And Shashi phoned up to ask, what's going on? What are you guys doing? I was the one that had to provide the explanation. And the explanation is very simple. If someone holds a gun to your head and you're entitled to defend yourself, you don't have to wait for him to pull the trigger before you fire back. And so the fundamental change between July and August 1995. Did he, did he buy that? Pardon me? Did yes. Did Shashi buy that? Shashi bought it. And, so what, and, and what did he tell the Russians? So the Security Council bought the, the argument. They did not censure um, the UN. And the game's rules had changed. We still had a mandate for Chapter 7 enforcement. We still had a mandate for self-protection. There was no change to the rules of engagement, but from that point on, there was a, a guarantee, if you threaten the UN, NATO will fight back. So from that point on, really, protection worked. But you cannot have protection um, without effective coercive force. You can't do it. Um, in your list of the platform for survival items, one of them is all states shall develop a UN emergency peace service to protect civilians and respond to crises. If you want to protect civilians in situations of genocidal violence and you attempt to do so without military force and without the competence to wield it, then you are kidding yourself and you are deluding the people that you are attempting to protect. I'm all for peace forces. I'm all for uh, white helmets. I think all of, these, um, all of these avenues are useful and effective in their time and place. But ultimately, if you do not have the capacity to execute lethal force, to break things and kill people, you're not in the protection business. Okay, that's, uh, now we're getting right down to a, a very good discussion. And, and you've put me in a box already uh, by assuming that I'm, I'm saying that uh, this UNEPS thing would be a, uh, uh, <laughs> some sort of nonviolent force. I think that I would say there ought to be room for uh, a, a group of people who do nonviolent uh, interventions. Uh, there are times and places where I think that can be very valuable. But I'm thinking now, look, I'm only speaking for Meta Spencer right here because this, the, the, the nature of UNEPs would have to be really worked out. And, and I don't think that what we've put together as a description of that is anything like a complete picture of what uh, the actual thing would have to look like. But, I conceive of it as an alternative to national uh, armed forces, that it, we need to make it possible for most countries to reduce their military forces because the amount of, if nothing else, the amount of expenditure uh, 
on military uh, as a portion of the world's GNP, if you will, is just outrageously overdone. We don't need and we shouldn't need that much. But of course, every nation feels it needs to defend itself. And unless some other source is going to be there to defend a country if it gets invaded by who knows whom, um, then uh, countries are going to keep their as strong a military as they can pay for, I think. Most countries will. And if we expect them to reduce their military forces, they have to have some alternative. And of course, that's what the UN was, was created for, to protect people uh, from the scourge of war. And, uh, and yet, uh, and nobody is going to trust the Security Council to necessarily come to their defense, unless it happened to be somebody who Donald Trump likes or God knows what. But, you know, the, the, the Security Council is, is not in any sense um, a democratic or an accountable uh, or even really very much bound by the rules of law, you know, international law. So it's not an objective source of protection for any nation. And, and any country would be kind of stupid if they believed that all they have to do is uh, count on the UN to defend them uh, and not think about anything else. So the UNEPS is to be a force that will be there ready to roll anytime any country gets uh, attacked, or I suppose you could even talk about civil uh, in, insurrections or, uh, you know, God knows what else. But at any rate, certainly international uh, attacks, uh, we should have an, an, a, a United Nations peace force that would include a, 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 a group of uh, military people with the equipment to really protect people and to intervene as need be um, with military force. So I'm I'm not I'm not suggesting a an unarmed peace force here, although I think there's room for part you know uh, units to be unarmed. I think there's room for civilians to be involved. I think there's room there for all kinds of uh, humanitarian organizations to be involved. I can see all kinds of ways that units could be coordinating uh, actions that would handle cons conflicts upstream before they become hot. So, but I, but I have not uh, myself come to the conclusion that we can just have an unarmed uh, UNEPS um, or even a slightly a white helmet type of uh, UNEPS. And does that answer your question? I, I don't think I asked a question, but yes, I think we're largely in agreement on that. Well, but I mean, you, you kind of assumed that that's what we all agreed UNEPs would look like. And I'm saying, if you think so, I don't think so, because I don't think we've decided that. I don't know anybody who would presume to say exactly how much military equipment or how what the uh, mandate would be uh, for well, let, let me Let me come back then to the... Um... Uh, the central problem of reducing the risk that war and weapons pose to global survival, because I think that's a, that's a valuable question. And my point is that addressing operations, as in what you do with military forces, is not going to get us to the problem of reducing the risk that war and weapons pose. I think that fundamentally, dealing with the problems of war and weapons is a question of reforming the profession of arms. And the reason that I shifted my focus, um, so I was in the peacekeeping business through until about uh, 1998. Um, from roughly 98 through to 2005, I was in the counterterrorism and special operations business um, and, and in teaching. Um, and Fundamentally, um, the nature of the profession of arms has to be changed in order for it to have a better range of um, tools to deal with the new kinds of security problems. We don't do that by focusing on operations. 
We do it by focusing on education. Um, and so really what I've been doing since 2005 uh, is focusing on professional development, professional military education, because I think um, changing the way that people think about violence and conflict, particularly professional soldiers, um, is our best hope um, for contributing to the management and prevention of violence. Um, it's not well, in the world. I don't want to divert you, but um, I, I, all kinds of objections come to mind. When they change the rules of engagement, everything changes. And people know what they're allowed to do and don't, aren't allowed to do. And, and, and you yourself just gave, gave an example of how for one period of time, things weren't working and, and they changed, Mr. Smith changed the rules and, and it started working. So it wasn't a matter of educating the peacekeepers, it was a matter of telling them what they were allowed to do and not allowed to do. But the fact that we were in that position is a consequence of the boxes within which we were constrained as professional soldiers. I'll give you an even starker example. The years, the decades that we've spent in, more than a decade that we've spent in Afghanistan in counterinsurgency operations has left Afghanistan at least as badly off as it was when we started. Um, and so that. it's not about um, how you conduct operations. It's about the range, the range of thinking that permits you to turn a counterinsurgency operation into a social movement to improve the social and economic standing of a, of a, of a people, for example. Um, and you're not going to find those changes in major powers. Um, the United States, Russia, China, India, um, the major powers have uh, tools at their disposal which are going to predispose them to um, escalating situations in ways that they can manage which their adversaries cannot. And so the real allies in changing the nature of a profession are the middle class countries of the world. Um, uh, how strongly I feel about this and how misguided I think some of the, uh, some of the efforts um, uh, to deal with security problems are. Mine? No, no, not, not, not yours, Matt. <laughs> you and I are allies. We're, we're all, I, I was waiting for you. Know. We're all allies. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we're not. We've had some good scraps. But anyway, onward. You would no longer, you would no more think about um, fighting disease by getting rid of doctors um, than you should think about fighting violence by getting rid of the military. You have to reform the profession that is responsible for managing the problem. It doesn't make any sense at all to try and abolish diseases by getting rid of doctors because doctors are involved in diseases like the bar barber surgeons used to be. The military profession is, as I was told when I was an officer cadet and as baby soldiers are told all over the world, the military profession is about the management of violence. If you want effective management of violence, you change the way that the profession deals with it. And that's a function of education. It's not a function of deciding how they're going to uh, deploy and how they're going to manage tactics and operations because those things are decided well before you ever send troops out. So I think we have to think seriously about how the profession of arms in the majority of the world's countries responds to the challenge of managing violence. And let's just start with the problem of violence. So out of 193 countries in the world, there were 31 that were actively involved in wars in the decade between 2006 and 2016. 31 out of 193. Um, the majority, in fact, there was not a single war in that decade, and I'm, I'm using CIPRI figures here. There was not a single war in that period that was a traditional state-on-state, army-on-army conflict. That's not the sort of violence that we deal with anymore. 
And yet, if you go to stop well, calling, ser serious sort of like that. <laughs> it's not. You don't even count that? Well, no, I mean, uh, absolutely not. There is not a single conflict in that decade in which there was a formal army representing a state attacking another army representing a state. Didn't happen. Syria was another civil war. Well, okay, I'm just thinking now of how the, the Russians and the, all these other... Not one. Lots of places where there are armies on one side, lots of places where there are armed factions on mm. two, four, or a dozen sides. Mm. Okay, all right. But I get the problem you. that we have is that if you go to staff colleges or military academies, and since 2009, I have uh, interviewed or visited military educators um, in more than 40 countries. And the common theme is that we are not professionally prepared to deal with, to manage the kinds of violence that we're facing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a graduate of an American U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. I understand a little bit about um, American military education. Um, we're not, there's no point in looking to the United States to solve this problem. The United States has its own internal difficulties and its own internal pressures. It's got a politically gridlocked system. It's got a military industrial complex, which creates enormous pressures uh, for the purchase of weapons. Um, those, are, those are part of the system which generates the kinds of violence that we need to deal with. The U.S. is not like any other country in the world, and yet... Um, it dominates a lot of the discussion about professional education. And so what we really need is a, um, uh, we need a consortium uh, of um, thoughtful, critically thinking defense educators to reform the nature of the profession and provide the leaders of tomorrow with the tools that they need to do not just peacekeeping, because that's only one part of the larger problem. Um, Maybe it's not fair. But I'm thinking of what would, if you were given Syria to handle now, having the mess already been made, or if you're given Iraq to try to straighten out after the fact, or if you're given what to do with Afghanistan now, or even in, you know, in advance of the fact, if you were given how to prevent a problem with Iran between the, the U.S. and Iran is one, I'm trying to think of what, you know, your brilliantly educated uh, military people, what would you do? Uh, yeah, give me some illustrations. The majority of the world's armies, military forces, are more engaged in various forms of internal security and policing, stabilization, counterinsurgency. They're not involved in interstate war. Um, so... What they need in terms of um, mental preparation is um, they need to understand political, economic, and social uh, phenomena that generate violence. Um, they have, they, we, uh, military forces have traditionally been involved in exacerbating both physical and structural violence. I don't think there's any there's any argument about that. And I think that's, that's a large part of the argument on the, uh, um, in the peace camps for the abolition of the military. We make matters worse. Well, um, rather than abolishing, if you focus on reforming to give them the understanding that, um, for example, and that you, wanted, you wanted concrete examples. So let me give you three. Hungary right now is dealing with... Um, uh, a massive influx of immigrant migrants across its borders. And as a consequence of that, over the last two years, um, uh, policing in Hungary has been militarized. I just came back from uh, Ergomas, the European Research Group on Military and Society, and we had papers from Hungary on the militarization of police and border security in Hungary. Um, there's a little bit of a contradiction in um, placing at the door of the military um, problems which are generated by civilian politicians uh, at the same time as you insist that the military has to be under civil control. Um, 
but we can live with that and we can manage it if we have professionals um, in the service of the military and the police who can present viable alternatives and who can articulate uh, what works and what doesn't work. So Hungary has militarized its borders. It's mil it has increasing uh, presence of the military um, in uh, policing in internal security. But at the same time, it's facing an acute labor shortage. And so it can't recruit the military or the police forces that it needs for all volunteer forces in order to secure itself against migrant uh, labor. Portugal's got the same problem. Um, Portugal has 10 million people and declining. They can't recruit or retain the military or the police that they need, and they can't absorb um, the migrants um, uh, into a cohesive society. Um, and so if we are talking realistically about uh, finding socially useful solutions to security problems that involve the military and the police, we have to talk about um, the role of the military and police in society and the ways in which um, uh, military or police or public service can be used to enhance social cohesion. And so now we're looking at the military not so much as a war fighting instrument, um, but as a vehicle for social cohesion, development, and uh, national character. Um, so all of, these, all of these ideas are not new, um, but they have been pushed out of the professional lexicon because um, in Portugal, in Hungary, as part of um, uh, NATO curriculum, uh, we copy, I say we because it, the same is true in Canada, um, we copy a professional military curriculum which is involved with war fighting and war winning on an American model. Mm. And yet that model creates security problems and fails to address the kinds of issues that uh, we really face, um, uh, cohesion, um, climate change, uh, dealing with population movement, um, ad addressing, addressing the potential for um, uh, aggressive expansion or instability on our borders. Um, so we really have to rethink the way in which military and police forces, because they blend in smaller countries. We've got this, I, this I, I, again, there's a mental image that the military and the police are two completely separate entities. Well, that comes from big countries. In small countries, which is the majority of the world's 193 countries, military and police inevitably cooperate. Mm. Okay, what I'm hearing, though, is not just a mer uh, blending of military and and uh, police but also a politics and 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 the military because, because the kinds of operations that i infer you're proposing that the military engage in are political interventions as you you solve social problems before they get to the point of a boiling over and, 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 and erupting in violence. Uh, and, the, you know, that, that there's been a, a, an implicit line drawn between the decisions of the state and the resulting of, from politics and the actions of the police, of the military, who are supposed to simply salute and do whatever they're told. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 your model, if I'm, and I'm certainly, I don't have a very clear idea of what it would involve, and I want a whole lot more of a conversation about that, but it sounds to me as if um, you would have the military be involved in all kinds of um, political and social changes that would prevent um, the kinds of tensions that would lead to violence. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. well military forces are intrinsically political. All military actions are intrinsically political. Um, Clausewitz is quoted far more often than he is read. Um, but, uh, Fair enough. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the separation, uh, the isolation of the military from politics is actually a very dangerous um, uh, phenomenon. Um, and uh, for, for, for anyone who sees this, I would urge you immediately drop from your mind the United States, which is different from everywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, our image of 
civil military relations and um, the separation, the, the Huntington Janowitz models in the United States are, um, uh, are simply not particularly useful in most of the world. And where military forces are used effectively, um, whether for peace building, uh, peacekeeping, conflict prevention, uh, nation building, they are used in intrinsically political ways that integrate social, economic, and political means. And I'll give you a whole, I'll give you as many examples as you want, but here's a couple. We have room for more examples, unfortunately. We're over time. Yeah. So I w- <laughs> and I wish we'd gotten down to this a little earlier because it's, it's the, the juiciest part of the conversation. Uh, at least it's the it's the, the kind that we need definitely do need to proceed with further. But uh, g- give me one example, and then we've got to call it off. <laughs> well, after apartheid, um, the demobilization, uh, disarmament, and reintegration of former ANC. Uh, irregulars um, involved putting them into um, uh, public service work battalions. Uh, The work battalions um, were taught skills and um, put to work uh, with increasingly specialized uh, subgroups of carpenters and plumbers and electricians um, doing public works and um, eventually uh, moving their, um, their, the members of that battalion into uh, civil life. So um, in other areas, um, so demobilization in Sierra Leone, um, the process of uh, training and development was, a, um, uh, was, was partly executed by the Sierra Leone uh, Armed Forces. The, uh, the National Disarmament Demobilization Reintegration Um, uh, commission uh, drew heavily on military forms of organization to move ex-combatants who were used to taking orders through the process of uh, social integration. Um, Another example, more contemporary, is that uh, um, the uh, civil defense manual of um, Estonia draws heavily on um, Eugene Sharp's principles of nonviolent civil resistance, uh, because the Baltic states recognize that um, they, even with NATO assistance and the NATO tripwire, they may well be faced with occupation. And so survival and national resistance entails uh, civil resistance and maintaining civil cohesion. Uh, Contrast that with the Yugoslav policy of survival and national resistance, which involved stockpiles of uh, weapons, ammunition, and fuel in every village controlled in decentralized fashion by uh, village, uh, town, township, uh, obstina level um, uh, leadership, which became the fuel for a protracted civil war. So, um, the contrast is that the, in the, the Baltic states, um, the framework for civil resistance is essentially nonviolent and unarmed. Uh, it's bolstered by armed, and, uh, ar- armed forces, uh, volunteer and reserve, and by a NATO tripwire. Um, but the preservation of social fabric uh, rests on the shoulders of citizens. So we could we could go around the world and look at different patterns in which um, uh, security is pursued effectively by military and police organizations in cooperation with society. Um, but the other side of that coin, the other blade to that sword, is that every time that you militarize society, you risk what happened in Yugoslavia, or you risk other forms of uh, social every violence. Every time you militarize society, you risk. I, I, I have to take your point because I don't have time to argue. And I probably agree with you in some sense anyway. But what I suggest is that we get back to this with a, two or three other people who, who have who are thinking along the same lines as you and then talk about this as an issue. So I need to call it off. Uh, c- call it to an end and uh, thank you so much I've enjoyed this very much David okay thank you Meta.
Fine. Bye bye. Bye bye. This conversation is one of the weekly series Talk About Saving the World, produced by Peace Magazine and Project Save the World. Please visit our website at tosavetheworld.ca, where you can sign the Platform for Survival, a list of 25 public policy proposals that, if enacted, would greatly reduce the risk of six global threats to humankind. Come back next week for another discussion of a serious global issue.